We have been talking about God the Holy Spirit for a little while. Okay? And I do not know how much you remembered. But then last week we started talking about spiritual baptism. And I want to refer or go back to the text and just Acts chapter 2 and just part of verse 1. The first statement in, in verse 1, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. And I remember the last day, the question was asked, what is Pentecost? We say we are Pentecostals. We are Pentecostals in belief. We are Pentecostals and practice. That's what we say. But what is Pentecost? But hear this this morning. Pentecost was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. So I thought it wise and beneficial to all of us to look into Passover. What is the Passover? First of all, so we can have an idea of some of the practices that we practice in the now. And sometimes we do things because like it has been said, it has been said here and in our family circle that we just, it's a pass on. It was just handed down to us and we continue the practice and we did not know or we does not know why we do what we do. All right. So what is Passover? Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. They were in slavery. They were in bondage. Why were they in slavery and why were they in bondage? Because they went against the word of God. They rebelled against the instructions of God and he allowed them to go into Egyptian bondage. But there came the time when Almighty God Himself said, Listen to Himself, it is time that Israel be delivered. It is time that Israel is taken out of slavery from Egypt, taken out of bondage from Egypt. Maybe this morning, just maybe, there is a situation. That has been plaguing some of us. Or plaguing you as an individual over the years. And almighty God is saying. Your deliverance is now. It is time for you to be delivered from whatever it is that has been plaguing you. Almighty God knows everything. He knew that Israel would have rebelled. He knew. That they would go, he would allow them to go. So sometimes, beloved, when situations happen to us, God is not a God by chance. He's always a God of plan, purpose, and destiny. God is always, he is always like that. So then God comes on the scene and speaks to his servant, Moses. And he said, Moses, I want you to give Israel this instruction. The head of every household. And today, beloved, it is sad to say we have a reverse pattern in the now. That the head, as far as I know, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the head of the household is the man. That's the word of God. The man is going to be held accountable regardless of. It comes just like the church. The pastor is responsible for whatever happens in the assembly. Regardless of his position, whether it's backward, whether it's the middle, whether it's forward. He is the man or the woman that God has placed in charge. So God is instructing Moses. To instruct the head. 
That's important. The head of each household to take a lamb. And let me read it and then I'll explain this. To take a lamb of the first year on the tenth day of the first month and set it aside until the fourteenth day. We are talking about the Passover. What does God say? The lamb must not be more than a year old. The first month in the year, the tenth day, the head of the household ought to go and take this lamb and set it aside. Keep the lamb, put the lamb somewhere. All right. One translation says, one commentary says that the lamb was to be among the household, that the members of the household were to get familiar with the lamb. And they were to keep that lamb until the 14th day. If my little maths is correct, right? That is four days. Take it on the 10th day. That's the instruction. Put it aside until the 14th day. But it must be a lamb of one year. It cannot go beyond the year. You see, what I've been looking at, and once I look into the word, I am realizing it is not so much the instructions that is given by Almighty God, but it's our obedience to the instructions that makes a difference. Amen. It's our obedience to the instructions. Now, on the evening of the 14th day, the lamb was to be killed and the blood of the lamb was to be sprinkled on the lentil, 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 right? And on the doorpost, the two doorposts. I view this as a covering. As a covering, watch it. The lentil, lentil and the doorpost. All right. Now, the next step in this is that the household itself was to feast on the body of the lamb, roasted by fire with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Let me break that down. Take the lamb. After you kill the lamb and you use the blood, roast the lamb. Wet bitter herbs on unleavened bread, no yeast. And they were to eat this lamb, wet the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs in haste. Why? Why were they supposed to do that? Why were they supposed to do that? And they must be ready to leave Egypt at the midnight hour. Now I'm trying to take my time to the best I can. All right. Why? Why the midnight hour? What is going to happen at the midnight hour? All right. Because at the midnight hour, the death angel would pass through the land of Egypt. And every household that does not have the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, the firstborn of every man and every animal would be killed. The judgment was death. It's simple instructions that we should abide by and they had to abide by it. Now the feast of the Passover originated in the passing over. The Passover is the passing over of the death angel over every household that had the blood on the lentil. And on the doorpost. That's the Passover. That's the Passover. All right. Now hear this one. Even though the instructions was given to Moses. To tell the Israelites. Or the Jews. Even if there were Egyptians. In the house. And there was blood. As instructed by God. Those Egyptian lives. Was spared. When I look at the New Testament and Galatians, there is neither Greek nor Jew, 
nor Gentile, nor bond, nor free. Every individual. Salvation is for every individual, not a selected few. So even the Egyptian that followed the gospel word at that time, their life was saved. Their life was saved. Now what's the month? The month does not run according to our Gregorian calendar. So the month was a month called Nisan. And the month Nisan in our calendar is March, April. The Jewish calendar don't have 31 days. It don't have 28 days. The Jewish calendar is 30 days to the month. This is information I'm passing on. Now there are two celebrations, and if I may use the term, two calendar according to the practice in Israel. There is the ecclesiastical year and the civil year. The ecclesiastical year is the religious year where the calendar, they have listed the calendar according to the instructions of Almighty God and the celebration of certain feasts on certain days. Then you have the civil calendar. Now it does not run side by side. Because the first year, the first month in the religious, for you to understand, the religious calendar is the seventh month of the seventh calendar. If you read Exodus chapter 12, it will tell us that God told him from this time. When it was seven months in the civil calendar, God told them this will be your first month from an ecclesiastical point of view. Now, what I would like us to pay attention to this morning, all right, is this statement I'm going to make. Death and mercy is linked together in the Passover feast. Death and mercy is linked together in the Passover feast. The individuals, the children of Israel that believe the word of God, handed down to Moses, handed out to them, and were obedient to the word of God, their lives were spared. Their lives were, were saved. They lived. And in the now, we have started speaking life in every situation that appears to be dead. We begin to speak life. And I want to encourage us this morning, regardless of the situation and how bleak it looked, how dim it looked, how dark it looked, begin to speak life into it. Begin to speak life. Regardless over the years, the situation seems to be continually continuing and continuing. We begin to speak life. The words that we speak, Proverbs says, the power of death and life lies in our tongue. It does. And what we have a choice to make this morning, what are we going to speak? Are we going to speak life into the situation or are we going to speak death into the situation? The death angel was passing, but the homes that had the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, those people were saved. The homes that had no blood, those people, the firstborn in those homes, they died. It's the same time the passing of the death angel. There was life on one hand and there was death on the other hand. Unbelief and disobedience brought death. So whether it was Israelites or Egyptians, the important factor here, the truth here, is that we believe the word of the Lord. Is that they believe the word of the Lord. The Passover brought death and judgment to those who disobeyed. It brought death and judgment to those who did not believe. But it brought divine protection and life to those who were obedient and those who believed. So this morning, people of God, we have a choice. 
we normally say, well, I don't have any choice. I didn't have any choice. But at the end of the day, when we make the statement, I didn't have a choice, we made a choice. We made a choice. So eventually we end up making a choice. So what I personally have tried and started doing is, Lord, I am making this choice. It's not that I don't have a choice. That's a wrong statement. I am making this choice. We can make the choice to live or we can make the choice to die. We can make the choice to come out of the situation and become a better person or remain in the situation and continue all our lives just like that. The choice is ours. Who could come here and preach? You can come. We can bring bishops. We can bring apostles. We can bring prophets and we have. And we brought people and we received prophetic words. And prophetic words were released. But yet somewhere along the line, we lost faith in the spoken word through the man of God or the woman of God. The enemy came and stole that word from you and I, and we went back to square one. We stopped believing the word, and we remain right where we are. Amen. Listen, people of God. The word of the Lord released through the prophet. Satan will not leave you with that word. The first time I heard these words, you have to war with that word. You have to pray through. We have to break through. It's not like, okay, God's going to bless you. You're going to get a car. You're going to get a house. You're going to get the land. But if we don't work towards it, it won't drop in our lap from heaven. We have to work towards it. Unless we are so blessed that our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents have inheritance coming down and we don't have to labor for nothing. Well, unfortunately, at the moment, I am not so blessed. Everything that I have achieved, the Lord has helped me to achieve. It. Everything. Even the man child that is here. Mickey is a miracle. Not once, but twice. The devil tried to strangle Mickey. The devil tried to take Mickey out at an early age in his mother's womb. Not outside, inside. But God have a plan, had a plan then, have a plan now, and God's plan is still the same. His plan have not changed. And to every person here and on the Zoom, God have a plan for you. And the enemy, I'm declaring this word in Jesus' name. Satan, take your hands up of God's people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, what God has destined for you, you are going to fulfill that. Your calling is going to be an election show begin to rise up people of God and cause the enemy to back back in a corner in the name of Jesus because there is power in the name of Jesus and there is power in the blood of Jesus but if we sit by and just sit down there we are going to keep on struggling and struggling and struggling because as a believer, you and I are now soldiers in the army of the... We have been singing that for so many years. Have you seen soldiers going to the war, going to war on the battlefield, and they sit down with their gears, or they lie down on their back with their gears, or they lie down on their tummy or their belly with their gears. And you and I as believers, Paul say, as a soldier of Jesus Christ, we ought to endure hardship. Amen. So it's not going to be easy. If we were taught wrong, we were taught that when you come to Jesus, 
you're going to get bread and fishes. Amen. But we still have to work. If you don't get up and go to work, you have no pay to get. And the idea that we have that the heavens will open and we'll win the lotto or the money will drop down is a false hope. Listen, from day one, when God created Adam, he said, look after the garden. So man, even before his fall, was created to work. Let me get back before I get carried away. The Passover was to be celebrated yearly. From that time, every year, the nation of Israel was to celebrate the Passover. They were to celebrate their deliverance from bondage. They were to celebrate their deliverance from slavery. And God told him, you ought to keep a memorial of the Passover every year. Every year. Is it, is it ringing a bell for us this morning? Why we have Holy Communion? And we have become so sophisticated that we just say the Bible, you will never hear a Muslim say the Quran. He always say, or she always refer to the Quran as the Holy Quran or the Holy Bhagavad Gita. But we have become so modernized that the Bible is just a jack and a beanstalk. And now we come IT, right? So much of technology that nobody comes to church with their Bible anymore. Even we as pastors. All right. No, we have the Bible on the phone. But in days gone by, you walk in the church and you know they're going to church because there is a Bible. I'm not against anybody. I'm just telling you what I observed and what came to me. I remember when you call the text in the earlier days, you'll hear the pages of the Bible rustling because people are looking for the text. You don't hear nothing about memory verses anymore. That's why we're growing the way we are growing. Nobody is memorizing the scripture anymore. How many of us can quote Psalm 100, Psalm 91, Psalm 27, Psalm 1, Psalm 23? And we can go on. 1 Corinthians 13. We are taken up. That's why the fight and the, or the battle has become so difficult. The Passover was a memorial of redemption and deliverance from the Egyptian life of sin and of bondage. What comes to your mind this morning? As a memorial, as a born again believer, what comes to your mind? What it is we were told to celebrate as believers? We are talking about the Passover the passing over of the death angel. And when the death angel passed, if you look into Exodus, the Lord said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's why we get a song from the hymnal. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. We pray in our homes, we don't use the blood. We pray in the church, we don't use the blood. What have we done with the blood songs? What have we done with the blood choruses? What have we done with the blood in our prayer life? It has its place. It's important. The enemy fears nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen this morning, church of God. When the devil touches the blood of Jesus, Satan will be saved. I want you to get it. The blood has power to save. It is the blood of Jesus. It's not mere mortal blood. He was God in flesh without sin. His blood still has power to redeem mankind in the hour. Matthew 26. We look at Matthew chapter 26. And we'll see the account that Matthew have recorded for us. Jesus celebrated the Passover. And in Matthew 26, the disciples asked Jesus, 
Master, where you want to celebrate the Passover? And he gave them instructions. Go down to this man and tell him, the Lord time is at hand. The master's time is at hand. My time is at hand. I want to celebrate the Passover at your house. So the disciples went, as the Lord told them, and made all the arrangements. But hear this one. The Bible says, Matthew records, while they were eating the Passover, and we talk about the lamb that was slain. We talk about the bitter herbs from Exodus. We talk about the unleavened bread. The Bible tells you and I this morning, beloved, that Jesus took the bread. And he break the bread. And he give the disciples the bread to eat. And he made, and I use this word, a profound statement. A very important statement. There and then, Jesus and the disciples is celebrating the Passover that Almighty God told them from Exodus 12 to celebrate. But this particular night, Jesus is breaking the bread. Follow me. And he's given to the disciples. And he told them, he said, take this bread and eat it. This bread is my body, which is broken for you. What is Jesus doing, doing right there? Jesus is changing the format of the Passover. He changed rather. He changed it. What he's saying, do not eat the body of the lamb. I want you now to eat of my body. We use the words, the emblems of the broken body and of the blood of Jesus. Then the Bible says, he took the cup with the wine and he gave, he said, take, drink all of it. This cup, this is my blood. This is a new testament. This is a new agreement. This is a new covenant that I am making with you. So right there, the feast of the Passover, there was a transition. However, Jesus was telling them then, and this morning we know, that Jesus, and I can't recall the exact text right now, that Jesus has been described as our Passover lamb. So we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That most of the times we partake of Holy Communion. Somebody quotes it. Somebody reads it. We hear it. Paul says. The same night Jesus was with us. Take the piece of silver. So the same night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke the bread and he said, Take this bread and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. He was speaking of his death not too far from that time. Because according to my limited knowledge and, and research, it was just the next day that Jesus died. So what it is. With the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus on the cross. What is significant about Jesus dying on the cross? The cross was not a big thing. Because during the Roman rule and Roman empire. Every criminal was hung on the cross. So Jesus dying on the cross. Was normal. Because they looked at him. As a rebel. They looked at him as a criminal. They had him in the midst of two criminals. But Jesus chose. And I go to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 to 20. And I read for you. For as much as he know. That he will not redeem. And I want to pause a little while. What is this word Redemption. We sing this song. 
redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. What does this word redeem? Israel in the Passover, they were redeemed and delivered from slavery and bondage. You and I are redeemed. Redemption means to buy back. And we have said this here in this assembly several times. And I will keep saying it until we get it. Redemption means to buy back. Redemption means to buy for oneself. Redemption means to buy off, off, two F. Buy off completely off the slave market of sin. I am declaring to all of us, whether here on the Zoom, that we are no longer on the slave Market of sin. Hello. I don't know if you're getting. Our master. Is no longer the devil. He has. No more. Control over us. The control that he had this morning. Is the ones that you and I gave him. That's the truth. When we dig into the word and we study the word, we are truly set free by the blood of Jesus. We no longer a slave to Satan. We have changed masters, but he is the type of individual that will not give up. So he'll keep poking and poking and poking and poking until he breaks us. That's the strategy. He will use anybody and everybody. He will use anything given the situation, the circumstance, just to bring us down. Remember how many years of experience, not trillion, not, not billion, maybe trillions of years, that this angel had. Way back, ruling with God, being with God. Amen. And we just are a couple of years down here. And we want to outsmart it. Peter is telling the believers that. And this time, in this scripture, in this book, First Peter, the Roman emperor Nero, he was burning the believers at the stake. He was tying them to the post and lighting them a fire. So Peter is writing, he said, don't think it's a strange thing that you're going through. And the word of God to you and I this morning, don't think it's a strange thing what you're going through. What we are going through has come and you're sitting there and you're saying, man, you don't know what I am faced with. Yes, I don't know. But God knows. And God's word to us is Think it not a strange thing that you're going through this fiery trial. Peter used the word fire because they were being burnt at the stake. In China, you know what they're doing with them? In Pakistan, in Afghanistan, the Christian. In India, all they have to say that you are against the state, you're against the government, and they come and take you, and that's the end of you. Churches are being burned down. Here we begging people to come to church. We have the program. Look, we invest 7,000 plus. The time of Daniel and, and Trevor and, and Daniel and all who came to help put it together. The money that you all invested and still people wouldn't log on. They could wreck it. The time has come. We are bringing the gospel to your home now. What else can we do? What else can we do? So he told them, listen, your redemption was not somebody. God did not take gold and silver and pay for your redemption. That is what Peter is saying. Right? It is with the precious blood of Jesus, or Christ as the word says, as a lamb Without blemish and without spot. The lamb that was to be sacrificed, you can't take no lamb with no one eye. You know, we like to give God them 
half with thing. You can fix it, man. Talk to me outside after. We're not giving God what we ought to give him. I'm not telling you to walk a straight path. Let the Spirit of God tell you that. No lamb with a foot broken or a saw. The lamb had to be spotless without blemish. That was a lamb. That was a lamb. And the lamb of God was spotless. He was pure. He was without blemish. And that is what Peter is saying. The blood of God's lamb. I'm here to declare to all of us that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Revelation will tell us that too. He is the Lamb of God. He is God's Lamb. And hear what Peter writes. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But was manifest in these times for you. Peter makes it personal. The lamb was foreordained before God said, let the earth be. The lamb was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but only now manifests for you. For you. Not for word and spirit assembly. Not for a bunch of people. God brought it down to the individual so that we can't blame nobody. Listen, when we stand up on that day, I can't say Aaron was the cause. I can't say Daniel was the cause. I can't say Mickey was the cause because the lamb, God's lamb, gave his life for me. And here Peter says, for you, for you, for you, it's personal. It's me and God. It's you and God. And that is what it boils down to. We can't say organization. We can't say the pastor. We can't say the elders. We can't say nobody. Nobody did not die for you, brethren. Nobody gave their life for you. Nobody could redeem your life except the Lamb of God. Except the shed blood of Jesus. What it is with Jesus on the cross? What is this manifest, manifestation? Jesus dying on the cross, first of all, was a manifestation. And I'm wrapping it up this morning. What is the manifest? What is a manifestation? It's a secret or hidden thing brought out in the open for all to see. Hear me. Go with, let's go down to Israel. Let's go up to the hill called Golgotha. There is the Lord on the cross. On a hill. Far away. Stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. Am I right? And here Jesus on the cross. All heaven was looking down. All earth was looking towards. And all hell was looking up. And there was Jesus. He was manifested even though before, before the foundation of the world, he was manifested about 2,000 years ago. What is about Jesus and his death on the cross? Jesus dying on the cross is an accomplishment. Firstly, it's a manifestation. Secondly, it's an accomplishment. What do you mean by that? Death in itself is not an accomplishment. Death in itself is a defeat. But brethren, beloved of God, a death with a resurrection attached to it is the greatest accomplishment of all times. Jesus Christ is the only person thus far who died and stayed three days 
in the belly of the earth and rose again on the third day and continued to live triumphantly. That's a good place to give the Lord. That. No other prophet, no other religious leader, their bones are still in some cave somewhere. But my Jesus, no bone is in no cave. His bones, his flesh and bones at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you and I right now as we speak. He's saying, Father, my blood was shed for crystal. Father, my blood was shed for Robert. Father, my blood was shed for Mickey. And that is what he's saying. He gave his life. I don't know if you're getting this word. You're saying I should have been dead. You should have been dead. But here is Jesus. Father, I will go in their place. And that's enough according to what is taking place in the worship group right now. That's more than enough to worship him. That's more than enough to praise him because I should have been dead. But he died in my place. And all not only died in my place, he has given me life to live this life. You are getting it. He has imparted unto me his life. He has imparted unto me his blood. Physically, I should have been there too. But Jesus, Almighty God, has a plan. God has a purpose. Hear me this morning. Until the purpose of God is not accomplished in and through your life, you ain't going nowhere. You getting it? That plan, his plan rather, and his purpose must be accomplished. God's will will be done. His will will be done. Thirdly, the cross. Jesus on the cross is a finish. You don't permit me. I hear this word, seriously. You don't need to do no puja. I don't know what the Spirit of God meant by that word. Because in my notes, I don't have that. You don't need no bull. You don't need no goat. You don't need no turtle dove. You don't need no pigeon. You don't need no lamb. Because the lamb of God His death on the cross is a finish. It finish. It finish. It finish. When Jesus said it is finished, we have given it so many other meanings. What was really finished? As theologians sometimes, we say the law was finished and we enter into grace. It could be so. But in the temple, on the Passover, the priest would be killing lamb. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, when he holds on to the last one and he slays that lamb, the priest in the temple says it is finished. In other words, there is no more lamb to sacrifice. You getting it? Jesus on the cross at three o'clock in the evening. When Jesus said it is finished, he was saying that at the same time, the priest in the temple was making the statement. You, you getting it? There is no more lamb to sacrifice anymore. There is no sacrifices anymore. Jesus is saying, this is the end of the sacrifices of every lamb. Because as the lamb of God, I am bringing a close 
to the sacrifices. I'm bringing a close to this. This is it. It is finished. How can I encourage you this morning? How can you encourage me as well to begin to live this life or to continue living this life as the finished sacrifice that Jesus did for you and I? It is complete. We don't need anything anymore. When we come to church, we come to celebrate Jesus. And there's a song, celebrate, celebrate. We celebrate Jesus now. I want to encourage us. I would like to encourage us to begin to celebrate Jesus. I don't know if you're getting it this morning. Begin to celebrate. How we celebrate each other's birthday. Begin to celebrate Jesus. Let's begin to bow down, people of God. When we pray, bow down. When we pray, honor him. When we go with our holy hands and, and, a, and holy lips and, and a clean heart. It is always advisable. Every prayer book that you and I will read, they will tell us we need to clean up our act before we can enter the presence of God. In keeping with the team that we have been ministering through about the Holy Spirit, we need the Holy Spirit to pray because most of the times our prayer brings this feeling right here, seriously. And it falls back. It is going nowhere. In order for the church to begin to function like the church in the book of Acts, we have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And I am saying this without any reservation without any regret, without any remorse. What we have in the now is plenty of languages. We speak in a language. And I want us to know that the devil also speaks in tongues. It's something that I witness. You ever hear demons plead the blood of Jesus? Demons when you say the blood of Jesus, the demon possessed person, the demon in the person is saying the blood of Jesus. Have you ever witnessed the demon in the person speaking in tongues? How can you tell the difference? This is where we need to have the rapport with God. We need to get in line and in contact and in communion with the Holy Spirit. Listen, prayer is no easy work, beloved. I will tell you that. It's hard work. Saying Psalm 23, we not going nowhere. You ain't start to do nothing. We ain't got a no corner weapon to start a fight. Psalm 23 have its place. Respectfully, I say so. But we are in a war. I don't know if anybody ever tell you that. It's not just about coming to church Sunday morning. We are in a real war. And here this one. The Spirit realm is more real than the natural one we see it. There's war going on. There's a battle that has taken place. The enemy don't want people to come here. I'm talking about here. You know why? Because here you will get the word. It's not just old talk. This is not nothing to do with me. Because when I come here, I just sometimes I don't know what, I tell my wife this morning, I say, I don't know what I'm going to do this morning. I don't know. I rely on the Holy Spirit to deliver this word. I want to encourage you with all honesty and sincerity from this heart of mine. Do what you do with the help of the Holy Spirit. Please. He was sent to help you and I to pray, to live this life, to worship, to praise. I keep saying, to even to play the instruments. Whatever little you do, do it. Call on him. He helps. 
the Holy Spirit is just like me right there. He's just like you, right? He's a person and he comes and he helps. He helps. He helps us. He helps us. Beloved, when you begin to worry so and you can't see and you call on him, he floods your being with peace. The spirit of calm and peace comes all over you. He is real. How can I impart this to you? I can't. Only the spirit of God can do that. Only the spirit of God can do that. Just stand with me. Whenever we celebrate Holy Communion, remember what Jesus did for you and I. Can you just lift your hand? Right where you are, is there enough breath within you to thank you? Thank you. Thank you, that you guys.